waiting for uh, another person or oh here we go. Okay. Now I'm just going to hit that on because you never know when the on air is actually going to go live and it will probably be when you're mid sentence as you. <laughs> uh, hello everybody. My name is Evan Jones. I am the Pursuitery.com um, community manager. Joining us this evening for a discussion about fanthropology, which is fan studies and otaku studies and the like, is Mr. Patrick W. Galbraith. Did I pronounce it right, Patrick? That is correct, yes, Galbraith. Good, I'm in the ballpark finally. Uh, so over the course of, of many years, Patrick has done a lot of series of studies and has published in many journals um, and magazines. He is currently moving on to his third book, uh, The Moe Manifesto, which is currently listed on Amazon. It will be released uh, later this June. Yeah, June 24th. On June 24th. Uh, previous, his previous books include The Otaku Encyclopedia and also uh, Otaku Spaces. And so basically we just decided to have a very general discussion about um, fan studies, uh, fan anthropology, which is what I'm dubbing it, and um, basically academic studies of, with, to, with regard to and relating to not only Japanese animation otaku fandom, as it's uh, somewhere marginally known in the States, but uh, collectors and uh, maniacu in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots of raw questions to get into. Uh, thank you so much for creating the time. This is our uh, halfway around the world geek out. One of, uh, I think you're the second from Tokyo. Oh, really? That's an honor. Great. Who was the first, I wonder? Actually, it's a funny story because um, some of the people from the Tokyo hackerspace, but I think you might actually be the first because thinking, 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 um, at the time that person might have been in Germany. So, there you are. All around the world. People connecting to geek out. I like it. I like it. It's, it's, what, it's what we do here for Sudri. So delving in and accessing my notes. Um, so currently, so currently, what what's taking up your days, Patrick? You're a busy guy, so. Uh, yeah, I try to keep busy. If I don't do things, I get in trouble, you know. So you don't have anything to do, and then things sort of spiral into uh, into chaos and, and madness. So um, right now, I'm doing a few different things. I'm starting a new project. Um, so I'm in Akihabara pretty much every day, um, this area of Tokyo, and I'm working now on small game producers, um, which is it's really fun. Um, so you get to interview illustrators, story writers, um, but then also regulators, people who are playing, people who don't play. Um, so it's, I'm trying to sort of get a feel for um, a, a, a sort of aggressively local game culture, stuff that doesn't really travel very well, but in a particular area, it's kind of central to that kind of vibrant media culture that you see in Akihabara. So I'm um, trying to sort of get into that. It's tough, you know, because um, everybody is sort of worried that, you know, that it's going to be misunderstood or that um, uh, somebody's going to come from the total outside and they're not going to get it or they're going to make them look like fools or something like that. So there's a lot of issues of access, which I think it happens a lot with fan studies. I mean, there's sort of an inside-outside kind of dynamic and then there's a lot of sort of feeling that, um, you know, you have this kind of, ever since Star Trek, actually, right, you have this sort of way of writing about fans where you look at them and are like, oh, my God, what are those guys doing sort of thing. Um, so people have built up, I think, this kind of resistance to outside slash journalistic slash academic interest in what they do, right? So in some ways, it's always a challenge to get into it. And I'm right at that phase right now where I'm just trying to work these different connections and sort of meet people and lay that foundation to be able to do this long-term, um, about a two-year project on uh, minor game production. And a question in the chat from uh, Sophia, who um, was known she had some camera issues. She was asking if it helps to be a fan yourself in that case. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Um, so Henry Jenkins, who kind of spearheaded this in the United States, he argued that you sort of need to be, so you have a sensitivity, but then also you're able to communicate with people that way. Um, and I think Jenkins is probably right about that. I mean, you do sort of have to not be 100%, you know, have this sort of battle of knowledges. That's always a challenge, too, I mean, because you're sort of in a perspective, where I am, usually always, is I'm in a position where I'm learning from other people. 
So they have a lot more knowledge about this particular genre of manga or this particular uh, moment in anime history or these games, whatever it might be. They're actually a sort of expert on that knowledge, and I'm there to learn from them. So it does help to be a fan because then you can share certain things. You know, if someone asks you, uh, what are you reading, what are you watching, if you don't have an answer, then it's sort of like, well, you know, you're not really communicating with me on an equal level. It's sort of like you're prodding me like some sort of beast or some sort of um, you know, research subject. I think nobody really likes to, to have that feeling that you're being um, analyzed or judged. So I think it's, it really is a good thing to try to participate. So if you have a sort of inclination or a sort of interest in this sort of thing, then it's sort of give and take. You're able to communicate and share with people. So I'm into this. What are you into? And then you sort of make a friendship and then build it on that. And I think those sorts of um, negotiations of shared interests are really the most interesting because people tell you things and they take you places that they wouldn't if you were just sort of like sticking a microphone in their face kind of thing. I wonder when we're talking about um, fans and fandom and how, and how you investigate fandom, if you can suffer from not only being too far away but too close to it in the sense that your own, your own biases, biases and your own, your own predilections may end up changing what you do. Like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, totally break, I'm totally breaking the wall on this one because I think... Uh, I mean, I did a, a lot of reporting on Japanese animation and Japanese pop culture stuff and lived there for a while. It's, um, but it's one of those things where I actually now am at a point in my life where if I look at something, I spend more time, like, talking about, like, fandom and exchanging information and, like, the study of this stuff and kind of reading about it almost anecdotally than I do um, consuming it in its in its proper form. You know, I'm... As I see my projector and I realize I have a stack of DVDs behind me to watch, including a still wrapped Fist of the North Star box set. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just it's, it's a different point in my life, but it's one of those things where I wonder if it's a it's a balancing act between the two, and one of those things I I just always think about like how does how do you keep that proper distance, but how do you bring you know the background and your own experience into writing about this stuff because. You've got to be passionate to write a book, and you've got to be passionate to do um, to do master's degrees or graduate degrees, or in some cases, uh, second PhDs. Plug, plug. <laughs> if you're if you're really masochistic, then you then you do that, right? If you if you really need that kind of recognition, yeah. <laughs> if you get bored, you get to run around screaming Grand Slam for the rest of your days. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So if you're able to really get all of those, yeah, but you're right. I mean, you have to sort of have a kind of uh, a reason to do it. I think, and it's the same for writing books and doing a degree. If you don't really have a reason, then it gets really old really, really quick. So you sort of have to have a kind of interest, and then you do find, I think, with most people, whether they admit it or not, they choose things that they're interested in. So you know, someone who's interested in food and food safety might do Fukushima or someone who's interested, you know, the, the reactor up there and the food safety and what have you. Someone who's interested in anime might do anime, right? I mean, so we don't need to deny that. I mean, I think that it's kind of the, the objectivity of academic inquiry is something that has been under fire for a long, long time. I mean, so we don't need to pretend that we're scientists out in the world, you know, gathering data in the terms of, like, it's stripped down kind of thing. So I really feel like you do have to sort of personally be involved, but then know that it does shade your uh, your understandings, right? I mean, if you get really into it, and then you start communicating with someone. I, I just had a discussion recently um, with a group of fans. We were talking about this series, Love Live. Um, it's not a very great animated series, but people really like the characters. And there was two faux pas. You know, I, I love faux pas because it sort of teaches you kind of what you can and can't do. So one of them was, um, it was one of the characters' birthdays, and I didn't know this. And instead of saying, you know, okay, wow, wonderful, I love that character, I was like, she's not the best. No, this other one. And then it, it was like, you know, wow, don't do that. Right? So I got too much, too much involved in sort of communicating my own personal tastes, and then that, that conversation went in a direction that it might not have. And then another one in the same conversation, um, somebody was talking about kind of directions and animation and that kind of thing, and uh, Space Dandy came up. And I'm not the biggest fan of Space Dandy, but um, I said something along the lines of, 
that's no savior of animation. You know, there's other kinds of things that are going on. You know, that's kind of like really weird to say that this is the best animation, that sort of thing. And um, somebody there was a really big fan. And so it became, it became sort of like a, a nerd fight kind of thing. So, I mean, it's, it's all, if you think about it, it's all experiential information coming in. You're really learning things from people and seeing how they interact. But at the same time, you want to be sure that you don't overpower and change directions. So what I try to do uh, is get involved, but then sort of be aware where your position is. So, I mean, you're never really going to get to, I mean, that there's two extremes, if I can be schematic about this. One extreme is you try to be totally objective, where you're not really involved and you're just sort of observing what people are doing, right? Then the other one is totally subjective, where you go into a place and you're sort of feeling things and you're, you're trying to get to the um, native point of view and then you're sort of taking over that position where you sort of sense and feel what otaku are thinking or what fans are thinking and that kind of thing. Both of them are kind of um, problematic, I'd say. So objective denies your own personal experience and then subjective denies the experience of other people and you sort of take over their position where you're able to say okay well as an otaku I can speak about how otaku would perceive this film or something and that's dangerous right because then you silence people both ways actually you silence people so you have to always I think be involved and be aware that it's an interaction a collaboration and then sort of see where your position is and how you're interacting with the person and if you can deal with that and it's really always kind of this weird navel gazing, able to sort of do that and not just ex not just be kind of like that outward outside scientist or that insider who has all the knowledge. If you're able to negotiate those two extremes, then I think it can be very productive to learn from people in the world. So going back to um, first things last. Uh, when you were initiating your stu your for more formal studies in the fandom, um, what what was your initial graduate degree work in? What field was it? Anthropology or sociology? Uh, yeah, so it was um, it was a weird backwards way that I did things. So I was uh, originally from Alaska, and then we moved to Montana uh, after the oil fields sort of changed a bit. So my dad worked at Arco, and then Arco collapsed, and so we went to uh, Montana looking for work basically um, so I was on a farm there when I was uh, 12 until I left for uh, for Japan and I went to university basically um, they gave me a free ride because nobody was going to university in Montana um, so they gave me sort of a degree uh, a chance to do a professional degree the idea was you do an in-state university and you do a professional degree so I was originally journalism actually so print journalism which is probably not the smartest thing to major in, but I majored in print journalism. And then um, they asked you to do um, this particular program, demanded that you have a second language. And so you could be whatever you want, but you need to do two years of a second language so that you could communicate with people in a specific field. Um, and I chose Japanese. And then I became really, really interested in the language. And so I started translating and stuff like that. And then I ended up double majoring. So I did Japanese translation. Japanese language and then uh, print journalism and then I took that opportunity through my degree in, in uh, Japanese to do an exchange in Tokyo and then from there I did Japan studies and Japan studies is sort of you know one of the area studies kind of you learn the language you learn the religion you learn the uh, e uh, economic situation politics basically everything so area studies is kind of one of those Cold War relics where you're supposed to learn everything you can about particular strategically important areas. What's cool about area studies is that um, it's a very specific set of knowledges. So when you're talking about, you know, the policy positions of Asaltado, you need to know sort of the, those broader sort of webs that make his statements significant. So it's really a kind of situated knowledge which from there was pretty easy to sort of shift to anthropology. I mean the difference between Area studies in anthropology is anthropology is a little bit, um, a little bit more reflexive about what it does. It's not really talking about the Japanese or that kind of thing, and it's a little bit more theoretically rigorous than area studies, but they're connected in some ways. Um, and then between those two um, things, between area studies and uh, anthropology, I did a degree in information studies. 
which is kind of like media studies, archiving, looking at um, old records and old documentary films and stuff and trying to sort of put together um, archives and try to figure out particular shifts that were happening in magazines and newspapers and, and uh, films, TV, things like that. So that's kind of how I got into it, from, from Alaska to Montana to Tokyo. So to uh, talk about the shift between um, your, your work in, I guess, uh, anim in animation studies, particularly into what you're looking at now um, and the upcoming book, do you feel that there's a lot of overlap between types of otaku and types of fans? Uh, more so than people be willing to admit, because there's a lot of narcissism from small of small differences among no, fans. Like, okay, well, I'm into mecha, but you're into that mecha, so you're not into mecha like I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm, for sure. I'm yeah. flying out in particular terms because it's 7:21 p.m. Um, on my side of the fence. But do you find that same those same kind of uh, little small differentiating factors between groups of fans to exist um, in other metrics and interest in fandom? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of amazing. If you look back at the, the record of, you know, the sort of evolution of fan culture in Japan, and I mean, it's pretty clear that it begins in the 70s and then it gets stronger in the 80s and that kind of thing. But if you look at back at the particular moments when people were getting really excited about particular series, there's always a kind of, you know... A narcissism of minor differences, like among sci-fi fans, for example, the it's really famous that um, that uh, people rallied around this giant robot show, Mobile Suit Gundam, right? So it was canceled, then it was sort of revived in films because of all of this huge interest. But if you look back at um, magazines and uh, books and things that were published at this time, sci-fi fans are like, Gundam's not sci. -fi. Well, like melodrama and character centric and it's not interesting at all and look at these freaks they're wearing uh, uh, Gundam costumes on the streets of Harajuku how weird are they right why are they doing fanzines about Gundam wow weirdos so it's actually very similar to what you sometimes hear about fans today right so I mean among sci-fi fans there was an othering of a particular sci-fi show an anime show but something that they thought wasn't quite up to snuff, right? So you're constantly getting this sort of thing, you know, is it, is it a real animation? Is it sort of a good period? Is it sci-fi? Is it not sci-fi? I mean, is it um, sort of too much character? Is it too much melodrama? I was surprised by how closely that Gundam debate mirrored some of the stuff that happened, you know, in the 2000s, sort of the debate about, okay, well, now it's all about you know slice of life and it's all about melodrama and it's all about characters and nobody's serious about you know this complex world of you know so they were talking about science fiction but you know whatever we, we might want to say I mean this sort of complex story world or this complex um, sci-fi world kind of thing so instead they're focusing on the the romance the characters the everyday life that kind of thing so I mean the same sorts of critiques come back again and again and I mean, most famously, I mean, you were talking about um, differences in categories of otaku. I mean, it's really interesting to me how the word itself was even, how it even came about. So an idol fan, a guy who's into idol singers, basically says, I don't like you guys making fanzines. You're really gross and weird. You don't know how to dress. You're not cool. So I'm going to put you into a category of otaku, right? And it's men, women, young, old, everybody. You're unfashionable. You're gross and weird. I'm a cool fan. So you could already see that kind of othering dynamic happening in 83 when the term was uh, was kind of first, when it solidified into the particular meaning that it has, uh, that it had throughout the 80s and 90s, which is gross, weird fan. I mean, so it really is a dynamic of some, yes, it's cool, but then not you guys. Right. So there's always that kind of, I think, um, Inner tension and dyna and uh, and infighting. I mean, whether or not um, people are always very similar, or or if there's sort of some sort of um, overarching connection between different fan groups. I mean, I think some people there's always a, a certain kind of shared desire to participate. 
I mean, I think if you want to look at a bottom line, I mean, so whether it's fanzines or cosplay or writing academic articles or articles in Animec magazine or whatever, I mean, there's always kind of this idea that a fan is someone who sort of takes it to the next level. They take it more seriously. They know more and they do more with the, they get more involved in the, uh, in the media that they're interested in. So I think that connects across different fan groups. And then whether or not this group is truly otaku or that group is truly otaku becomes um, identity politics, plain and simple, I think. Excuse me, Stone or something. Would, how much do you see as an actual physical ownership being the defining, being one of the defining factors of modern fandom? Because we're always constantly deluged it with the arguments that you know there's there's fewer and fewer retail spaces for things like records and uh, to and books and music and movies and DVDs and the like uh, in America mm. and and digital downloads are becoming more popular and you know as well as um, Ill illegitimate digital downloads. Um, do you see that often something in people who have, are obsessed with like I need to have it and own it in a physical capacity, especially considering your work with Otaku Spaces. Yeah, so Otaku Spaces was an interesting one. Um, so what we tried to do with that book um, was a, a few different things, but first was um, the collector Otaku thing. So we were basically looking at different people who were identified um, as, and then we would ask them, um, you know. S questions that usually you wouldn't ask, like, um, are you an otaku? Or what is the connect what is the collector an otaku, things like that. And, you know, it was just this rich array of different understandings about what it meant and whether it was generational, whether it was um, about gender, wh whether it was about what you collected. Some people said it was about that. Or some people said, well, no, I mean, a collector puts things into boxes and puts them up on shelves and they want to own everything. But Notaku is someone who just really is so into it, right? So you don't buy a figurine to put it on the shelf and put it into a collection. You buy the figurine to take it out of the packaging and play with it or look at it or, you know, um, to build it or that kind of thing. Right? There's something about you want to get your hands on it, you want to play with it, you want to be involved with it. So everybody had these different ways of understanding it, but it really exploded some of these um, some of these understandings. There was this one interview, this young man, Quintessa, who was um, into trains and ranger shows, like transforming, you know, ghost, um, Power Rangers kind of stuff, and uh, light novels, a whole bunch of stuff like that. And he actually was sort of like, okay, I'm, they don't have much stuff. I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of things. And, you know, so he wasn't, it was sort of like this apologetic feeling where it's like I don't really have enough things or enough knowledge to be recognized as an otaku. But then when he was asked, I mean, do you consider yourself as such? He's like, well, I'd like to. I'd like to think that I am. And so this kind of idea that, you know, if he doesn't have enough stuff, he can't really be that, uh, that ideal I don't know. I think you're right that there's there's so many other ways that you can do it these days. Like you don't really need to have the special perfect Blu-ray box of Macross 2 to be the uh, to really get involved. I mean, it's possible to stream it or watch it with a friend, or you know, to go to a theater during a special cheap uh, screening of it there or whatever. Right? I mean, it's possible to do it in a different way where it's not necessarily you know like. I have a huge collection which then allows me to know more than other people and then to say interesting things. During the sort of sci-fi part of um, otaku history, that actually was kind of what it was, right? So to be an elite fan, you sort of had to have access to a lot of information, whether it's magazines or books, a lot of foreign books, and of course the knowledge to read them and that kind of thing. So you have a collection. And apparently, this is something that was told to me, but uh, apparently one, one, one sort of reason why Otaku was used among fans was it means your home, right? Yeah. So do you, does your home own this book? So it was kind of a, a sort of collector's thing at that point, where then elite people like Okada Toshio and others who came from families that could afford this kind of thing, where he was able to be surrounded by this material, 
could then have these really interesting thoughts about sci-fi that someone who hadn't been exposed to those books wouldn't be able to have. But I think that era of, you know, the, the genius um, critic or the genius person who has all the knowledge and also the person who owns everything is sort of shifting, right? And now I think it's a little bit more collaborative. You share information, right? Like you don't necessarily have to watch everything to sort of have an idea on how things evolved and how they changed. Um, I'm, I'm teaching this anime class right now, and um, it's surprising to me. This, the kids are like, what, um, 18 to 22, about that age. And they've never seen the original Gundam. And I show them the original Gundam, and they're like, this is boring. So, you know, it, it, you know, they don't, but that doesn't mean that they're less fans, you know. I mean, they just, they've already seen so much material without owning it. They've seen so much material that it's kind of like this throwback thing. They're not going to buy the special Blu-ray edition of Mobile Suit Gundam from 7980. That's really not what they want to do. I can imagine some fans, like, wanting to own that Blu-ray. But I think that's kind of maybe less common these days. Um, so I think there is a sort of a shift between, or a difference perhaps between a collector who wants to own and put it on the shelf and make sure he has everything, this sort of co completest uh, mode of engagement. And then this other mode of engagement is where, you know, I just want to enjoy it. I'm going to watch as much as I can. I'm going to talk to as many people as I can. I'm going to write blog posts and I'm going to put it on Twitter and that kind of thing, which is a very, a very different way of, of engaging the material, but it's no less intense, I think. I mean, it's not like they're more shallow or something. That's one critique that some some people levy at um, young people today. Well, oh, they're just shallow, right? They're not really getting involved. They're not really owning things and watching it 20 times and really sort of getting into it and, you know, showing people the series and making them get into it and sort of sharing their deep opinions about, okay, was Char really Garma's friend or not, or whatever. I mean, like, really watching those series, those moments very closely to then get that insight. Instead, they might be watching five different series and then noticing that these characters look similar to those characters. They're both ways of, of engaging the, or going the extra step beyond just normal watching, I think. So I think both are, are fan engagements, right? So that's just a long way of saying, I'm not sure that you have to own things to be an otaku, and that was one thing that came out with um, Otaku Spaces, just a variety of different people who were, you know, collecting calculators and not, you know, um, anime manga stuff, but they were huge anime manga fans. So, I mean, what they collected didn't necessarily reflect who they, or their particular engagements with the media. We, uh, we kind of skipped over a, a point earlier. We also skipped over my excellent record of Lotus Wars joke. <laughs> um, skipped over a point earlier um, that I want to ask, with so much coming out and so much um, being aimed when we speak about, you know, we speak of these preset definitions and spe specifically in the English language fan studies world, Otaku being, you like this. Uh, whereas I, I knew Otaku who were like, um, say, very much into a certain uh, time period of literature, uh, train spotters, people that were um, obsessive about one thing or another. Um, and so what I'm wondering now is we see an increase in production and more and more stuff coming out. Um, if there's a degree of alienation happening because the popular consensus is that um, otaku culture or aspects of white culture seems more aimed at a certain subset than another. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, you're really onto something there. I think that's why a lot of people get so upset. You know, like when you have these old, these, not even old guard, but like mid-range otaku guys who weren't in the sci-fi community necessarily, but they were right on the edge of sci-fi anime fandom like Okada Toshio. He gets, um, he gets upset by what he sees, right? He's like, this is not the fandom that I remember. This is not what I'm interested in. I look at anime today, and it doesn't look like what I remember, what I helped produce as well. I mean, he was a producer. And I asked him straight up, I mean, do you feel that um, fanzines are creative? And he looked me in the eye, and he said, if you think that fanzines are creative, there's nothing more for us to talk about. So for him, it's just very different, right? That kind of remix culture 
which I think is very commonplace. For it's, It makes sense to a lot of people who have grown up in a digital age where, yeah, you, you remix stuff. You sample, you're remixing, you're making different things, you're doing sort of side stories, alternative world stories, that kind of thing, and then from that remixing, you come up with your own personal style, right? Mm -hmm. For him, no. I mean, you should have kind of like this this great idea that then allows you to produce something fantastic and wonderful. So for he doesn't like anything that's coming out, new stuff. So he would just basically say everything probably after um, Evangelion, actually. So everything after 96 is basically crap for him. So, I mean, there are people like that um, who I think their particular interest isn't represented because the market isn't really there for it. So, you know, people aren't really going to be buying as many um, figurines or as many toys or as many Blu-ray discs, right, which are incredibly high priced. But if you can reach that niche market, then you can you can survive as a studio, right, even if you're not making money off of sponsors, even if you're not making money off of um, commercials and stuff like that. So I, I think that there is that kind of alienation happening or that sort of tension between uh, between different groups for sure. But at the same time, I mean, I wish that like Okada and people like him would watch something like uh, Madoka and just see that actually in 2011 we have a deconstruction of the cute girl genre, right? Magical girls. I mean, so it's not as if there are no interesting works being produced half as many episodes as Evangelion, much lower budgets, and still an extremely interesting series that is really well done that shows you kind of what the genre is supposed to offer, overturns it, and then leaves you with this, this powerful message. You know, so I, I don't know. I'm still really excited about what you know, Japanese media can offer, so I hope that there won't always be kind of like these camps that say, okay, well, you you're kind of the one that everybody sees, but that's not my that's not my jazz. So I'm not interested in you and then you know you're not a real fan and then that one small step from I don't like what you like is you're not a real fan, well you're not a real fan. Then you have this weird infighting which um, I think divides um, opinions and then you basically have micro fights instead of kind of people celebrating uh, the art form. It's more like tearing it down in different ways which is Sad, I think. Oh, sorry, I, I had a follow-up point, but I did want to acknowledge uh, Sophie put in the comments that she was having some issues hearing your audio. I'm, oh, uh, okay. I'm Can I hardwired in, so I'm not really having bandwidth issues. That's um, Sophie. It may be your connection. Um, I just want to clarify that that was getting out there. Okay, let me um, let me get closer. Is that better? Okay. Um, yeah. One of the, the biggest point I was making with uh, my really long questions um, was that there was a, a joke made a while back about, you know, hey, characters, characters in the show that aren't 15. <laughs> yeah. So the the, yeah, the age thing is is definitely yeah I mean that's kind of the the, the hot button issue right I mean it seems like um, governments are talking about it fans are talking about it producers are talking about it you know, what do we do about this long legacy this very long history of focusing on young characters right originally it was for you know we're aiming at that audience you know so I'm a little ready you're a fan thirteen mm -hmm. probably if, and you're really into it you're probably going to be a fan for life in some capacity. Yeah. So then, yeah, then you have sort of this particular relationship with that moment when you got into it where it has that kind of, you know, possible double meaning sort of thing, and then you really explore that, and then over the course of time, you're still watching something that you engaged with a long time ago, right? So one person said this to me really eloquently. It's like the problem with anime is... Um, you grow and they don't, right? So you say, like, for example, um, I'm into Evangelion, right? Yeah, I mean, the characters are 14, yeah? I mean, but I mean so, 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 you know, at the time, when you're in junior high school, it's like you really identify on that level, but then as time goes along, your connections, your the way you watch the series changes, right? Every time you watch it is different. 
but that doesn't mean if it's a good series, every time you watch it actually continues to, it grows with you and continues to be different and exciting, right? But the well, same, the problem is the characters are, are the same, right? So it's, oh, well, you know, it's immature or it's, you know, it's weird or whatever. I think, um, Sonny, remember that this is my pet theory and I've been articulating it for years, um, and I sort of finally had some, had to get hammered home finally, and I was very happy about this. Uh, one of my earliest interests was in punk rock and underground music, and kind of pretty much still am. Of course, that paradigm shifted greatly uh, with access to modern media and the like. But concurrently, I think a lot of my interest in Japanese uh, animation came out of a period where it was in, in itself an experimental uh, ex experimental phase. You had, you know, OVAs and the like, and lots of, like, there was a big kind of push on the same sort of uh, exploitation film train that you saw with, like, Canon Pictures and the Terminator and the like. And I do consider the Terminator an exploitation film, even though I love it. I don't, I don't feel like I'm bagging on it at all. But you were kind of looking for, you know, the, the bigger bump, like the more extreme, the more intense, the more underground. So... Mm -hmm. I got into, I feel like I got into animation particularly with the same sense that I got into collecting weird records. And I was saying I kind of felt that I heard this borne out as being a realistic idea when I found out that Kevin Seymour, who is uh, uh, one of the, he was one of the head people at U.S. Renditions and most, and recently passed away um, a few months ago, if I believe correctly, was very much into underground music in the same way. There's that kind of squirreling through and looking back and crate digging to kind of get this weird stuff and then put it out there uh, mm -hmm. when it may have been a very little, a very little validity um, pop culture wise. You know, you were looking for hyperbole, and at that point, you know, you have something like Bubble and Crisis, and it's it's a uh, its weirdest moments could satisfy that for if you were a Blade Runner fan that wanted more. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas now there's been such a shift, you can just walk down the street, but that is my own pet theory, and I'm sticking to it because it works for me. No, I mean, it's really interesting that you would say that. This um, this book just came out from um, Duke University Press called Jaffa Noise um, by David Novak, and he's, he's oh. talking about noise, yeah, sort of the way that Japanese music came into the United States and how things that really were hard to categorize were sort of read as noise. It's like Shonen Knife, which is not noise, it's, uh, but that was sort of read as kind of funky, weird Japanese music, and so it came together in this kind of amalgamation, out of order. You know, getting these kinds of tapes or getting these um, things that were not circulating in these major stores and things like that. People are passing it along. It's a bad recording, that kind of thing, and so you get this kind of distortion in the reception. And it's really interesting how he, he, he kind of looks at both together. So he's obviously into animation and that kind of thing, but then also really into Japanese music. And so you can see how kind of for him as well, there's this kind of coming together of this, something comes in, you don't know what it is, and you're sort of talking about it, you're sharing with it, you're doing sort of some, uh, some searching it is, and then you sort of see, oh, well, there's this noise scene in Japan, or oh, there's this animation scene in Japan, and then it kind of creates this feedback loop where then when things come in, you can sort of read it as oh, it's this kind of anime or it's this kind of noise. I mean, so I think those feedback loops are so interesting, and then the ways that people um, sort of make meaning with what they receive, I think it's a really big part of the, maybe specifically the American perspective, because we didn't really have, you know, like Italy, France, places that had you know, Mazingrazet, you're being shown to everybody, right, where this guy told me that um, in Italy, uh, Mazinger is a sort of slang for you're acting like a robot, right, so women, children, old, young, would know this, right, so Mazinger is just sort of like, well, it's seeped into popular culture in a way that didn't happen for us, you know, until something like Pokemon, right, so before that, I think there was a lot, there was many years from the 70s up until the 90s when there were kind of people who were looking for that new thing, who were getting that tape, who were sharing that, who were writing sort of liner notes and what have you, so it does seem to be um, a similar kind of, you know, in subculture engagement, like what you're talking about with music fans, 
And it's it's kind of amazing and cool, I think. I mean, I didn't have access to that stuff in, in Montana, unfortunately. <laughs> it was more like, you know, you write somebody, please sell me this kind of thing, but... Well, the, the obscurity was the kick in many ways. By the way, I was getting a little bit of an issue with your audio there. You got it very robot-y, which I think is funny, considering your... I'm a robot. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm a zingering. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you can always... You can always uh, you can always cut video, or you can, if you okay. scroll to the top, it you can hit that gear and like pull it back down. Yeah. And then hit the gear. It's all right. It's just, it just went. Bad on you. Yeah, it just went. It just went a little goofy on you. Okay, is it sound, sounding okay now? Yeah, it sounds solid. Great. Okay. But, yeah. Well, the, but the obscurity. But the obscurity thing and searching for obscurity and defining the identity politics. Oh, looks like he he fell out. He dropped down. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, did, I, did I die out there? Was that me? Was that the? It was you. Yeah, yeah. You just started. You were you were talking and then stopped and gone. Yeah. Ah, oh, great. So that video. So that that video is going to be fun. Um, yeah. Apologies to everybody. No. Ooh, no. The point I was making that obscurity was a it was a big part of it. Um, it's odd. I've, I've, I'm hardwired in. Maybe I uh, breathed on something. But the, the hunt for obscurity and the, the personal identity politic that you get out of it and the kind of joy that you can associate with having this thing that not many other people are into, and if they are into, uh, you can have that much more of a connection with them. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that applies just as much as to, like, looking up, um, you know, Hijo Kaidan records and the like that uh, uh, Novak was writing about um, as it did, at least in my own personal case, I'm speaking uh, ethnographically, read, I have a bunch of mech at my house, uh, <laughs> of, that kind of, of that kind of form of expressive medium, whereas now I think it's really easy to bag on, and this is, see where I tie it together in the last 10 minutes, I think it's easy to bag on Moe, and mm. those kind of forms of fan culture, and just as it is, like, you'd, you'd say, like, oh, well, people just like X-Men aren't comic book fans. Um, right, you right. Start Films aren't science fiction fans. I think those are the same kind of jumps that people can make, just because they're very easy and it's low hanging fruit. It's very popular. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, with the Moe book, um, it's kind of similar to Otaku Spaces in the sense that it's it's interview based, right? So there's a bit of an introduction that sort of lays the groundwork, but then it's really just hanging out with people, asking them questions about how they got into this, what they're doing, you know what they think of it, what's sort of the, the bigger picture, that kind of thing. And it was surprising to me how many people um, had very personal stories to tell about, especially anime, right? So sort of saying, like, um, for me, uh, I couldn't get to sleep at night. I was having sort of these, uh, these terrible panic attacks kinds of things. And then I saw noir. And then the area of noir became like, wow, this is so incredible, so amazing, and then they begin to write fanzines about the characters of noir and that kind of thing, or putting up posters on their bedroom walls. You know, so it, there was kind of also this discovery, you know, so at a very particular point where you needed something, um, something more, they find this thing that really anchors and grounds them and helps them sort of make sense of things, you know. 
And then the most extreme example um, are the people who have long-term relationships with characters, right? So it's really such a personal and in, in, uh, intense feeling that you get from this encounter that you're able to sort of say, okay, well, not only is it my thing, you know, like discovering this thing and finding it in the record bin, but also I'm going to devote myself in this kind of very public way to this relationship, which for me is very real and very meaningful. So that kind of, that different way of engaging, but equally as intense, maybe even more intense um, than what I remember um, with anime manga fans when I was younger. I mean, so yeah, I mean, sure we wore anime shirts, and sure we had, I mean, some of us uh, got tattoos, conventions, and stuff, changed to the floor, is that, so I mean, there is that kind of thing where you really get into it, right? You're so you're sort of devoting uh, a huge amount of energy to it, but I mean, this other way of doing it, where this is it's an intensely personal kind of relationship, but then one that uh, folds out into other kinds of relationships, where then you're producing fanzines, you're buying figurines, you're going to conventions, and you're getting signatures, you're yeah. So I mean, I. I thought the Moe stuff, I think you're right. I mean, it's easy to dismiss it, but I think probably the issues are, are beyond um, are beyond just the characters, you know. So if you want to talk about what's wrong with the the industry, you know, it's you're right. I mean, it's easy to say, okay, well, there's too many people who are into characters, and these people are buying character goods and media, which then makes it a particular kind of market skew. But then if you think about it, I mean... A bigger problem would be the fact that studios aren't making a lot of money, and so they need to sort of capitalize on niche markets. And so, for that sense, I mean, you you have to wonder about who actually gets into a, gets into a studio to produce works at this day and age. And I mean, if you're not making a lot of money, it's sort of below minimum wage, you're working so hard, you don't really have an opportunity um, to live a full life outside of that particular job that you, you have and it's not stable. I mean, I think that it's, the fact that people still make it is kind of amazing. You know, they're still kind of really into it, but in, in that sense, I mean, the people who are making it, the people who are consuming it, are kind of doing it for intensely personal reasons. So I think it's beyond just, you know, there's girls or cute characters in animation today. It's more sort of like, I think, the sustainability of it um, as an industry is something that needs to be considered, right? I mean, so you can't really do a 52-episode huge series and just hoping that you'll sell, you know, sell toys to kids because there are no kids. So, I mean, like, a lot of the market logic that used to work for these shows that we loved growing up, they don't work anymore in this kind of niche-ified market. Yeah. You have a, you have something like a, a you know a de ever declining birth rate and also shifting interests like um... mm -hmm. yeah um, so I mean I was in, I was really interested to see how people um, experienced it right so not from a necessarily critical standpoint some of them were but the people who were talking about it were looking at it from sort of an inside perspective of people who who loved animation um, in a way that was sort of different from what I remember personally, but then it sort of resonated in certain ways, like um, listening to these uh, these people speak and sort of having these conversations made me remember, you know, these encounters that I had with certain characters. Like I remember watching Sailor Moon, um, you know, when I was much, much younger, um, and it just it struck me at a particular time of my life where I was uh, very depressed, I wasn't very happy with what was going on around me, and um, I really just latched on to that story, and I loved it. And I remember, I remember exactly the scene that shifted my interest from, okay, I like the story, I like the characters, to I'm really, really into this. And that was in the, uh, the season where... Um, Darian, you know, he gets this message from the future that he needs to uh, stop dating Serena because the pod, it's you know she's going to be uh, these catac uh, catastrophic consequences if he doesn't stop dating her, and so he breaks off their relationship. You know, it's just kind of developed into this wonderful thing, and you know, you're really rooting for these two, and then he says, "Okay, no, I'm done. Get out. You know, you're too young for me. You're not interesting. You're not." 
And so he, he, he gets all, you know, he gets all angry at her, and then she goes off, going home, collapses into a phone booth, and just starts sobbing uncontrollably. And the line art was so incredible, the music, the vocal performance, everything, right? And I just was like, yeah, okay. I, I'm in love with Serena. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's like that. so I, it made me so sort of realize that my own deep interest, long-standing interest in animation kind of starts in a way from a very personal moment where, you know, it was no longer just a story. I was really invested in this in this character, and I was really invested in uh, her world and her her problems. Oh, do you think uh, the fast follow-up question? Because Sophia's got one here that I want to ask. Uh, the fast follow-up question I had to that was: Do you think now that you're studying and beginning to study games, do you think you're seeing a lot of people who would have worked at animation studios working at game studios? Yeah, that was interesting to me. So a lot of people who started working in um, the uh, the PC games, they kind of they the way they narrated was um, there was a renaissance in the late '90s, early 2000s that overlaps with the kind of decline of um, TV animation. Again, this is the way they talk about it. So they say that a lot of people jump ship from animation to produce games. But they were at this particular time. It was kind of like um, you could do more. Graphics were better, better stories, more control, that kind of thing. So they were, they sort of, they kind of saw it as a new opportunity. So if you think about these wonderful games that were being produced in the late uh, '90s, early 2000s, which really overlaps quite a bit with what we kind of think of as the Moe boom. So after Evangelion and this kind of boom in in uh, in games, and then after that, it sort of comes back into the late night market in the early 2000s. So that renaissance that happens, and it actually begins right about the same time as Evangelion. You have Tokimeki Memorial, Two Heart, stuff like that. And so I think that for a lot of people, it was an opportunity to do something a little bit different, to have a little bit more control. So it wasn't that they wanted to be animators and they went into games, but that they also saw that games offered a different set of, of potentials. That's one group of people. Another group of people um, are the group that I'd like to call like the slide downers. And the slide downers are people who wanted to do something else, like they wanted to uh, illustrate for Capcom, but they couldn't illustrate for Capcom. And so they ended up trying different job listings and eventually ended up at a PC game company, which accepts uh, people without industry experience, without um, proper training, and it gives them an opportunity. So you can have young people who uh, who don't have the credentials to be huge creators, and yet they are, like Maeda June um, at uh, Visual Arts. People who had an opportunity, despite being very young, to write the script for a whole game that then allows them to sort of become this superstar uh, scenario writer, and the same for animate uh, for uh, character designers. Amateurs can do it. There's a lot of people um, who are coming, um, you know, uh, technical colleges or ha from having drawn for their whole lives. They're kind of picking it up and learning as they go. So there's a lot of opportunities in PC games that are that makes it very exciting. I think for some people that it's you know people who wouldn't necessarily usually be doing it can do it, and then at the same time, people who had the opportunity to do it at the industry level can do it to sort of get more access to, or to have a little bit more creative freedom. So you end up with this kind of, um, this mix of people that tells different stories, that has different characters, and then this gets cycled back into animation, right? The same way that light novels, which are super cheap to produce, you just need an illustrator and a story writer. The same way that that kind of gets wrapped up into new creative flows in animation. But, so I'm, that's kind of one thing I'm looking at with this. Um, yeah, so I mean, the creators are really interesting. and It's kind of from now I'll see kind of where it goes. But my first impressions are that a lot of people are very excited about the possibilities of PC games, and some people are more like, ah, yeah, I didn't really want to do it originally. It kind of was my second or third or fourth or fifth choice, but then I ended up doing it, and now I love it. Right? So I've never met anybody so far who's like, Freaking hate these games. I don't want to do this anymore. So they're a little bit more positive about what they do than you know 
triple A games that are more like, okay, Japan's in decline, Japan's not doing very well. So there seemed to be a little bit more positive about the potential of, you know, storytelling and character development and things like that. All right. Uh, Sophia has an excellent question here. Um, I'm going to read it back. Uh, what kinds of other positive effects have you noticed this media has on fans? And by media, uh, talking about both anime and gaming culture, um, or is it unique for each one? She's particularly interested in this related to learning and identity development because she's studying learning sciences in graduate school. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Um, so there's a lot of positive effects, it seems to me. Um, and one, I think, is just that it allows you, um, how should I say this, to explore other opportunities. So one person uh, in the bo uh, interviewed for the book, and I've hung out with him for quite a while, um, is Honda Toru. And Honda Toru is kind of, um, let me write his name here. Uh, and he's kind of an advocate for, um, how should I say this, for alternative relations, right? So he doesn't necessarily want to be a particular ideal or men to be a particular ideal. And instead he says, okay, well, this kind of hegemonic form of gender identity or gender performance sticks us into damaging roles that we can't actually meet. It makes us feel like less than we are. It makes us sort of hurt one another, hurt ourselves. And so he tries to kind of um, look at a sort of failed, a, a, a possibility for doing things a bit, a bit, uh, a bit differently. And so, like for example, he he had all these people talking to him about suicide, right? And so we know that the suicide rate is, is quite high in Japan. And his solution was, feel like you need to hurt yourself, then you can retreat, right? And what he means by that is take some time, right? Take some time to think and to explore and to not try to match up with what you think you need to be with what's he thinks the anime manga games are a really good opportunity for this, where you're able to sort of go back, spend a little time thinking, spend a little time sort of exploring different worlds and sort of different parts of yourself as well, that allow you to sort of come to a certain kind of balance or a certain kind of, um, yeah, I think he'd say balance, that allows you to sort of not hurt yourself, let alone others. So he talks about people who have done sort of um, street stabbings and things like that, and he tries to sort of tell people that, you know, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, this particular world and your particular um, problems now. So I think it offers a kind of escape, but then it also offers to explore different potentials. So I mean, all these different um, genders that you see in animation, all these different relational patterns and everything, he calls this a thought experiment, um, so a shiso jiken, and he thinks that thought experiments are really very, very positive for people. It allows you to sort of come to different understandings of yourself and others in the world. So exploring other worlds and the sort of interstices between, you know, these different worlds. Um, and he personally uh, has had this as well. Um, so he told me, um, and it's in the book, but I mean, it's, um, it's worth relaying here as well, but he was apparently extremely depressed for many parts of his life, right? So he felt like, um, you know, people didn't like him, that he wasn't really succeeding, and that kind of thing. And so uh, up to the point of being actually even suicidal himself, but then at these moments, he sort of found things that excited him and kept him kind of grounded and also connected him to other people. So one example is, so Evan said Fist of the North Star. He loves that series. The reason why is because he was at a point in his life very, very low. He wasn't feeling very well. And then he said, okay, well, okay, after Kinshiro and Rao fight, okay, then I'll kill myself. But, you know, the fight never really ended. It just kept going longer and longer. And then by the time he got to the end of the fight, he's like, oh, I feel better. I'm not actually, I'm not in that particular moment in my life anymore. So it sort of gave him time to then, you know, to not do something rash, to not hurt uh, himself or end his life. And, you know, he had these terrible moments, like his entire house was destroyed in the Kobe earthquake. But then right after that, you know, he finds 
Evangelion, right? Which then again gives him this kind of passion, this excitement that allows him to sort of start over again and redo basically his whole life, right? So, I mean, these constant moments in his life where he's thinking, okay, well, I need to sort of get away from animation or stop the geekitude, uh, but then kind of he has these particular encounters with series or characters or creators that then really excites him, gives him passion, gives him direction, uh, and now he's um, uh, social analysis, social critique, but he also writes light novels himself, he scripts animation, so he's kind of succeeded in his life by sort of sticking with what 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 uh, what makes him passionate. So I think people like him are not that rare. You know, people who who need something, who find something, and whether it be animation or trains or cars or whatever, right? I mean, it's kind of great to have that thing. And for him, the difference with animation is that it's very personal. And it's something that you can sort of get into by yourself, and then you sort of get that in that interaction going with the character and with the world, and then it sort of sucks you in, and by virtue of participating in the world, it kind of offers you another self or another world or another set of possibilities that you don't have right now, but then you have access to it through this imagination. So it's kind of like this cultivation of imagination that he thinks is is um, really cool and really positive, and I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, you can never you can never have too much imagination. You know, imagination is a, a rare resource these days where it's like, well, we can't get past capitalism, we can't get past the gun issue, we can't stop wars, we can't go to the moon, we can't do anything, right? So, I mean, this kind of idea that, well, no, you can imagine the possibility, right? And that can be very exciting to imagine, well, what if it was a different world? What if it was a world where I wasn't who I am now? What if I was in a world where I was, you know, um, this or that, or him or her, or this uh, creature or that creature. I'm sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I think this is, it, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I think it's something that um, needs to be explored more, because I mean, it's one thing that um, is often said about anime manga games, especially those three, is this escapism, right? It's really, it's not good, it's not it's not helping you engage with the world, or worse, it's teaching you kind of bad understandings of the world, like it's the killer games, or the rape games, or whatever, right? That the games are teaching you, you know, bad habits, or teaching you um, to escape the world, or teaching you sort of damaging, um, damaging misconceptions of the world, but I'm not so sure about that. I mean, to me, it seems like having an, an open and active imagination um, is a positive thing. That's a solid, that's a solid place. Um, is, that a, is that a door or a penguin? Um, the penguin? Uh, he's in my he's in the my, my freezer right now. He's gonna come out and offer me an Oski. Yeah. I was trying. I was trying my very. Uh, I was trying to set that up. But, uh, not a, not Abusu, Abusu, but um. No, uh, he's bringing me. He's bringing Asahi. I don't drink anything besides Asahi. I, people tell me it doesn't taste good, but I tell you, no beer tastes better cold than Asahi Super Dry. Uh, that's that's what we need on the web on uh, the website aimed at thirteen. <laughs> that's right. I just I just plugged that. And by the way, I am sponsored by Asahi Super. Not true. They would never sponsor me. Um, that's a solid place to uh, to end as any. Um, I would like to thank you so very much for your time. The Moe Manifesto will be out um, on June twenty fourth. Yes. Yeah, June twenty fourth, and I think it's supposed to be everywhere at the same time, so it should be available in the United States, East Asia, um, Australia, Europe. All right, it is listed on it is listed on uh, Amazon, and uh, you can find it in many other fine bookshops. It's from going to be coming out from Tuttle. Uh, thank you so very much for making the time to talk to us. Hopefully, we'll get to do it again soon. I'm going to click the uh, stop broadcast button if you want to stick around for a few minutes and talk about other things. But uh, as far as the, the uh, geek out goes, from all of us pursuitery, thank you so very much for the time. And, no, uh, thank you. Yes, great. thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. I love